People often fear those they perceive as different. That can be somebody of a different race, somebody who practices a different religion, somebody who speaks a different language, or somebody of a different sexual orientation. For example, back in 1967, CBS News released a documentary called The Homosexuals, an hour-long broadcast anchored by Mike Wallace. The program portrayed gay men as mentally ill sexual predators, as uninterested in and incapable of lasting relationships, and as a threat to children. The stereotypes perpetuated by that show persisted for decades. Americans believed that same-sex relationships posed a threat to themselves and to society. As recently as 1996, only 44% of Americans believed that same-sex relationships between consenting adults should be legal, and only 27% supported same-sex marriage. Today, those attitudes have shifted considerably. Now, 73% of Americans support same-sex marriage support same-sex relationships, and 63% support same-sex marriage. What happened? Why did Americans stop thinking that same-sex relationships were a threat? In large part, it was because gay and lesbian people came out to their family members and friends, showing those straight people that they already knew and loved gay people, that gay and lesbian people were part of their in-groups. In-groups and out-groups are how people make sense of their place in the world. Everyone identifies as a member of a number of in-groups, while they consider folks who are different to be members of out-groups. We tend to favor members of our in-groups and look to other in-group members for guidance on what to think and how to act, while we're less likely to listen to or to help members of out-groups. When gay and lesbian people began to come out in mass numbers in the 1990s and 2000s, many friends and family members changed their, changed their consideration of same-sex relationships and marriage because those messengers were also their in-group members. It didn't always go smoothly. Sometimes coming out was painful and dangerous. But often, it helped change how gay people were seen and understood. What if you're not a member of an in-group and you still want to change someone's mind? What if you want to be an ally for social justice? In 2009, I flew to Evanston, Illinois to give a talk at Northwestern University. Brian, the grad student assigned to pick me up, had read about my work with community organizations and took the opportunity while I was in the car with him to pitch an idea. Advocacy groups around the country were working to increase support for same-sex marriage. Maybe we could work with some of those groups. He asked if I'd be willing to help. It wasn't something I knew a lot about, but I was willing to learn. So we started reaching out to those advocacy organizations, asking if we could work with them and how we could help. One group, Equality Illinois, wanted to know how to increase support for same-sex marriage among black Americans. Equality Louisiana wanted to know how to increase support among more religious Americans. What we found in that research is that in-group identity can boost the power of in-group messages, of persuasive messages, even when those messages are about an out-group. When we told black Americans that President Barack Obama had changed his mind about same-sex marriage and was now a supporter, they were 10 percentage points more likely to agree. The effect was even stronger when the messenger was also black. When we told religious Americans that a reverend believed that same-sex couples should be included in the sacrament of matrimony, they were 22% more likely to agree. It even worked for sports in-group identities. When we told fans of the Green Bay Packers that Packers Hall of Famer Leroy Butler supported same-sex marriage, they were 15 percentage points more likely to say that they did too. It wasn't that Leroy Butler or Barack Obama were gay. They were acting as straight allies, changing minds among other members of their in-groups. The messages were also particularly effective because they were counter-stereotypical. Folks did not expect a marriage supporting gay people from a religious leader or a professional football player. The dissonance of those messages 
increased their effectiveness. Brian and I used that logic in our research to help increase support for same-sex marriage and other gay rights. Then in 2015, the United States Supreme Court ruled in Obergefell v. Hodges that same-sex marriages were protected by the Constitution. Prejudice still remained. There were still plenty of folks who did not approve of same-sex marriage and were opposed to same-sex relationships. But the advocacy groups we were working with felt it was time to turn attention to another critical group, transgender people. In contrast to the improving attitudes towards gay and lesbian people in the last few decades, prejudice and hostility towards, gen- tra- towards transgender people persists. They are often the victims of violence and even murder. From 2013 to 2018, at least 128 transgender people were murdered, most of whom were women of color. The deep levels of fear and disgust that people have towards transgender people means that a different approach is necessary. What Brian and I have found in our more recent research is that the key is to appeal to folks' existing values and to reassure folks who are uncomfortable that they are good people. Here's four key key takeaways from that research. First, start the conversation. Changing minds sooner rather than later means making it a social priority and making it the topic of frequent conversation. It's okay to not know the perfect thing to say. The more important thing is to show how important it is by talking about it. When your mom says something at the dinner table about how scared she was when a man dressed as a woman came into the ladies' restroom at the office, don't just look down at your plate. Start a conversation right there at the dinner table. Ask her why she felt that way and why she's bringing it up. And then share your perspective. Don't berate people. Don't say that they're stupid or that they're a bad person. That'll just make them dig in their heels. But don't leave that intolerance hanging there. Start the conversation. Second, share your own journey story or the journey story of others to provide a model about how one can become more supportive of members of outgroups. When we told folks the story of Kimberly Shapley, a religious mom who changed her mind about transgender people when her daughter came out as transgender, they became 9% more likely to say that they felt comfortable around transgender people and 18% less likely to say they thought transgender people were mentally ill. Knowing that others have changed their minds makes it easier for folks to allow themselves to do the same. Third, emphasize the good in people and how good they'll feel when they act in a way that's consistent with their core values. There's a, powerful el- there's a powerful emotion called moral elevation. It's that warm, fuzzy feeling you get when you watch viral videos of firefighters rescuing ducklings stuck in a sewer, or a man jumping onto the subway tracks to rescue a stranger who's fallen off the platform. When we showed folks a short viral video that showed them how good people can be to one another, it made them want to model that behavior their levels of transphobia decreased, and they were 17% more likely to sign a petition saying transgender people should be allowed to to use the public restroom that corresponds with their gender identity. When you feel good about yourself, it's easier to be more open to accepting others. And finally, you can increase the likelihood of persuasion by bringing in backup, celebrities and attitude leaders who agree with you. When we told folks that Admiral Mike Mullen, former chairman of of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, supported transgender people like Staff Sergeant Logan Ireland serving openly in the U.S. military, they were more likely to agree. When we paired that message with an appeal to their core value of equality, they were 29% more likely to sign a petition in support of transgender troops. You have this superpower. When you start conversations, you can change people's perspective, change public opinion, and change public policy. It sounds like an easy way to get the side eye, but it works. We know it works based on a decade of public opinion and political communication research. It doesn't mean folks have to be completely comfortable. You can still feel uncomfortable about people who are different and want them all to be treated equally. 
That's true whether you're pushing back against transphobia or homophobia, against xenophobia or Islamophobia, against sexism or racism, or against any of the other isms or phobias that plague modern society. It might not work right away. Think of it like launching a boat across a body of water, sailing from prejudice to inclusion. Every time you have a conversation, you're giving that boat a little nudge toward the other shore. And it might not work on everyone. Some folks are so committed to their opinions that you can't get them to see things a different way. But sometimes you can get them to change their perspective. It can't hurt to try. The only way that change is impossible is if we don't try. Being an ally for social justice means having those difficult conversations with members of your in-groups and helping them to change their perspective and want to treat folks who are different with equality and justice. This is America. Let's make it a better America for everyone.